Hi everyone, my name is uh, John Ranieri, I'm uh, with Open Civic Technologies, and um, I, my background is chemical engineering um, from Case Western, and I, then I spent about 18 years um, in the industry so far working with Rogers, and recently joined uh, Open Civic. So a lot, a lot of interest in this technology in particular, and I'd like to be able to share this with you and uh, give you an idea of what embedded capacitance is all about. In our in our products that, that go along with it. <laughs> yes. So just for an agenda, I'll give a, a basic uh, introduction to Open Suite Technologies, um, and then talk about what what embedded capacitance is, some of the benefits, and then some of the processing. So, you know, Mitsui Kenzoku is a, is a very large company actually that um, is based in Japan and um, our division, uh, the copper, copper foils division, um, provides, is one of the largest providers of, of copper foil worldwide. So um, our direct customers many times are either uh, printed circuit board shops or the material suppliers. Um, the headquarters in Tokyo and you can see um, we have three manufacturing sites, one in uh, uh, what we call ACF, which is the Geo copper foil plant in Japan. Uh, a second called TCF, which is uh, Taiwan copper foil. And then the third is MCF, Mitsui copper foil, and uh, uh, in Malaysia. And so the, the Malaysia factory is actually the primary location uh, where the Farad Flex is, is manufactured. So I'll talk about that um, a little bit later. Um, here in the US, um, we have uh, a, uh, our, our site, Oak Mitsui Technologies, which is a subsidiary of Mitsui Kenzoku. It's basically the same company. And um, that's located in Frankfort, Kentucky. Um, and then uh, Ken Nakamura uh, is here, also from, uh, from Oak Mitsui, uh, from Kentucky, uh, as well as Bob Carter, who couldn't be here, and myself. We also have one um, additional rep in the Bay Area, um, Yoshi Fukura, who can help us uh, with um, not only a better capacitance, but he does a lot of um, uh, simulation and modeling as well. So uh, he's a double E, and he's very helpful to us. And so when we have uh, detailed questions and customers who need help with design, a lot of times we'll, we'll pull Yoshi in for that, and he can help with modeling. So our applications. Um, the largest applications now are really commercial um, in very high volume, so routers and switches and servers um, up on the upper left. And then the other is the MEMS microphone application that John talked about earlier. Um, you know, in, in most smartphones and um, other uh, devices are, are these small MEMS microphones and they use uh, buried capacitors in those, in those microphones as well. Those two um, are sim similar materials, but uh, there are some differences in between the materials that are used in the routers and the materials that are used in the microphones, so I'll talk about that a bit. Uh, we do have other applications, uh, military, aerospace, drones, uh, as well as some medical and ATE applications and a few automotive applications. Um, but the bulk right now is in, in those other two that I, that I discussed. So here are the three uh, products uh, that, we're, that we are supporting out of Open City Technologies. The first is Ferret Flex. Uh, this is the very capacitance material. What it is, is it's an ultra-thin laminate. It goes down to uh, three microns. Uh, for a dielectric thickness, uh, has a really high electric strength. Um, it has a mid to high dielectric constant, and it's used for um, embedded capacitance. The other two products, um, the other is uh, one that actually Ken supports quite a bit, which is the micro thin copper. This is a copper foil that comes on a carrier, and it can come down to 1.5 microns. So really thin copper, uh, copper foil. It's used at both the package and the board level. Um, and it's compatible with the MSAT process, so the semi-additive um, process. So um, this is used in like smartphone uh, uh, main boards um, and packages, other, other kind of things that require really, really fine uh, traces and spaces. 
<clears throat> so if, if there's any interest in that and learning more about that, we'd be glad to talk about it. Um, this presentation focuses really on the, on the fair flux, but just let us know. We'd be glad to, glad to discuss it. And then um, we also sell um, various kinds of uh, standard copper foil as well as VSP copper foil, which is, uh, stands for very smooth profile copper foil, um, used in the industry in very high speed and high frequency applications. So if you have any questions about that, we'd be glad to answer those. Okay, so, so what is a planar capacitor? So the materials that we have available are basically laminate materials or core materials that are have copper on both sides, different types of copper, different thicknesses of copper, and they have a dielectric in the middle. And the dielectric uh, varies, and I'll talk about the different types of dielectric that we have in the center of these. And you know, the, the important thing about this is that what you're doing is you're taking two plates basically and making a capacitor with it. Instead of having discrete capacitors on the outside of the board, you're putting it inside the board and you have these two parallel plates um, that are made with the laminate. And the capacitance value varies depending on um, a couple of factors. And you can see that the equation for capacitance Yes. So you can see the equation for capacitance on the left here. Um, K is, is basically just a um, just a constant. Uh, DK is the dielectric constant, and then D on the bottom is the thickness of the of the of the laminate. And so the thinner the laminate is, um, the higher the capacitance, or the higher the dielectric constant is, the higher the capacitance. And so those are the two primary things that we vary in order to change the, the capacitance. So there are three types of uh, buried capacitance materials that we have available. <clears throat> the first is um, fairly simple. It's a reinforced material. It has a high performance polymer film, um, usually either polyamide or polyimid film um, inside the material. And then there's an epoxy or another type of resin that, that we use to bond the copper to that film. Um, so that is an unfilled epoxy or unfilled resin. So, um, you know, a lot of times this is kind of the most cost-effective version. Um, it, it has the best processability and probably the highest reliability because that film provides really high electric strength. Um, so you can get um, electric strength that's you know, well over a thousand uh, volts uh, from, from these materials. So that's one example. And then on the right here we have kind of like the names of these products. So MC24M, MC is basically just uh, Mitsui capacitance material. The 24 is the thickness, so that's 24 uh, microns. And then um, the M means that it has a, a, a film layer in it. So each of our materials, you know, have different, uh, um, you know, you can refer to them with, with these different uh, naming conventions. And we have a decoder that we can kind of tell you what they mean. If you're looking for it, depending on what you're looking for. So that's one type of material. Then on the other end of the spectrum is uh, unreinforced material that is filled with, filled with a film uh, epoxy resin. So here you see that there's no um, polyimide or polyimid uh, reinforcement here, um, but you have high decay particles that you put dispersed into the resin, and um, and you can make this really thin and really high dielectric constant. So the, the benefit here is, you know, very high decay, very high capacitance, um, extremely thin um, and reliable. Um, the, um, the sort of drawback to this, uh, to this is that um, because it does not contain the reinforcement film, um, you have a, a lower electric strength on this material. Do you have any questions? Yes, sure. Sure. I do. <coughs> so how, how do you pour? those particles inside the two layers. How do we put them inside yes. the two layers? Uh, we I mean, uh, for instance, do you have a measurement that how much you get in there in order to get the right for the value for the DK? Yes, yeah, so that's all controlled. So basically, yeah, we mix, we mix, you know, we do a mixing operation and then a coating operation. So that's all completely controlled. And yeah. could you kind of tell me what are those particles? I cannot. <laughs> but, yes. <laughs> but yeah, that's a little bit of the secret sauce. <laughs> uh, but they're high dielectric constant particles, that's the, that's the idea. Um, so then, the, then there's the third, which kind of combines the, both of the other two ideas, which is that you have 
the polyimid or polyimid reinforcement, um, and then you have high dielectric constant particles uh, filled into the epoxy and you put that together. And that gives a good balance of um, dielectric constant, um, the reliability in terms of the electric uh, strength, and then, um, or withstand voltage, sometimes it's called, and, and, and capacitance. <coughs> So here are, this might be a little bit hard to see from the back here. So here, here's a kind of an idea. We have, we have two kind of separate uh, uh, you know, product lineups. One is really made for um, full-size printed circuit boards. So these are the servers and routers and RF boards and you know, uh, boards that are made sort of um, at, the, at the PCB shop. And then we have a, a lineup that is more geared towards um, uh, these uh, MEMS microphones or modules or packages. And so really the big difference is that the, the reinforced materials are more often used in the printed circuit board, uh, the larger printed circuit boards. The reason is that you can print, you can uh, process them as a double-sided board, um, and then you can laminate everything together. So you're processing it just like any other core. Um, you process it as a double-sided board, and then you do a single lamination. You can use the unreinforced material as well in a large printed circuit board. What that requires is that you do sequential processing. So you etch one side, you laminate everything together, you etch the other side, and then you finish the, the lamination. So there's a little bit more steps involved there. Um, it can be used, uh, but more typically we see this set with the reinforcement being used in the larger boards. So, you know, one of the things to note here is we have, and uh, if you look at our um, online, you can look at our um, kind of product lineup, and we have here the dielectric thickness, which is critical, and then we have the capacitance, and the capacitance is given in uh, nanofarads per square centimeter or nanofarads per square inch. So, how big of a capacitor can you make? It depends on the area, and it depends on the nanofarad per square inch uh, number that you have. Um, Based on based on the material itself. The other thing that's important is the breakdown voltage. So for all of these which have that reinforcement, you can see the breakdown voltage is above 1,500 volts, um, which is pretty high for a very thin material. Some of them are as high as um, 5,000 or greater than 5,000 volts. So really high breakdown uh, strength of these materials. And the reason that we're able to get that is again because of that reinforcement. So this is the product plan for the. Um, the MEMS packages and modules kind of line up. And again, here, you'll see a few things. One is that the dielectric thickness is, starts at half a mil and it goes down to three microns, so really thin. Um, at that three micron, we have a dielectric constant um, that's you know around 22. Um, at eight micron, we can get up to 30, so very high dielectric constants. And then the capacitance per, um, per uh, area is also very high. So at the three microns, you have 40 nanofarads per square inch capacitance per area, so it's pretty high. Um, but then if you look at the breakdown voltage, it's much lower. So you know, at three microns, we have about 50 volts of breakdown voltage, and that's just because of the thickness of the material and the lack of uh, reinforcement. So these are used in applications where you need 10 volts on a plane. You know, it's, it's, it's used in applications with, with much lower voltage. So, you know, why use embedded capacitance in these thin dielectrics? Um, you know, th there's really uh, three, three main reasons. The first is a better power delivery network because you're able to lower the inductance loop um, and, and therefore lower the impedance and reduce the amount of noise that you're generating with the, with the power, with the PDN. The second is you can uh, lower the size of the print circuit board and the weight of the print circuit board. <coughs> Um, you can remove most of the 0.1 and 0.01 microfarad decoupling capacitors on, mo on, a, on a lot of boards. And so you don't have to deal with the routing to those capacitors, and you can remove the physical capacitor from the, from the board itself. So there's a, there, in certain designs, that's a, that's a big benefit. And then, you know, what you're doing is you're not really adding material. You're actually taking the power of the route plane, which you already have, and you're already making on FR4, and you're just replacing it with a thinner material, essentially. So you have a thinner stack up. Um, there's no additional material involved. <clears throat> the third, it's higher reliability, and uh, we'll, we'll show some data on that. And then, you know, these materials are compatible with most standard PCB processes. I'll talk a little bit about processing 
and um, they're commercially available, available in high volume and QTA. Uh, that's one of the things I didn't mention. Um, again, uh, these materials are used, like I said, in very high volume uh, in commercial and consumer applications. But we also have a QTA uh, warehouse where we store materials in the U.S. and then um, we supply U.S. and European-based PCB fabricators with a quick turn operation out of that warehouse. So if somebody needs something quick and you want to do a prototype, we have uh, a lot of material in, in, in different thicknesses, different configurations stored in the warehouse. So this is uh, so moving on to the, kind of the first idea here, which is better better power delivery network. Um, you know, this is typically what you have to do. Um, usually, you have your IC component, and then you have decoupling capacitors, and there's traces between them. You have to hold, drill holes to get down um, to the power plane, um, cover up. You have traces, um, and what we we suggest doing is instead of doing that, to just change it so that you have the the IC component right above the the, uh, the power level or the power uh, plane and ground plane, and that reduces the, the loop that you have to go through to essentially to get down to the power plane. <clears throat> so this is the, the suggestion here. Um, what that does is it, it, it lowers impedance and especially lowers inductance at higher frequencies. So here's an example of a test that we did. We set up this, um, this self-impedance test, and you can see we have VNA port one and port two here, and then we did the measurement. And what you see is a chart like this, where the, and there's a lot to this chart, so bear with me here, but the, the top lines here you can see are ZBC, uh, which is a two mil and a one mil uh, ZBC type material. Um, and then as you go down the chart, we're inserting different uh, power planes or different materials into the power plane. So we tested all of these different materials in the power plane. And you can see at the lower frequencies, you're in uh, like capacitance mode, and then as you get into um, some of the higher frequencies, then you uh, form an inductance loop. So um, what you can see here is that, you know, the idea is to reduce the impedance as much as possible. Um, and you can see that with the, with the standard sort of uh, ZBC materials, um, you have a fairly high impedance, and then, uh, of course, it is coming down um, as you go up in frequency to some low point. Um, but as you add MC24M, MC16M, you're reducing the thickness of the material. So MC24M is the thickness, it's about one mil, 16M is 16 microns, and then MC8M is uh, eight microns. And then we actually uh, get a little bit thicker, but we, we actually increase the dielectric constant of the material. So MC12TM is the higher dielectric constant material, and MC16T is the highest dielectric constant material. So you can see you're reducing the impedance um, just based on the material that you put into, in, in, into uh, that power plant. And then this is kind of a zoomed in view to the latter half of that chart. So you can see that there are resonances that are happening with the two mil material and the one mil material um, in the, you know, uh, because of inductance. Um, and then uh, you can see here how you are, again, reducing that. This is basically just a zoomed in version of that. Um, but not only are you reducing the, the sort of the nominal um, inductance, but you're reducing these resonances that happen as well. Um, and by the time you get down to you know the Ferroflex MC16 uh, or MC12M, um, they're pretty much gone. This is an example of a simulated example of even higher frequencies. So we actually simulated what happens, and it's very similar to the other chart. Um, we simulated what happens in the gigahertz range. So a lot of customers are using uh, this material. Um, because they're dealing with very high speeds and they need a power a PDM that can deal that can deal with that, and so you can see you get up into the gigahertz and at the MC3 TB, which is very thin material, um, you know you're dealing with very low impedance in the uh, in the up to 50 gigahertz. Excuse me. Yes. So this is the resonance at that frequency that happens. For example, if you look at the blue line, the previous slide. Mm -hmm. You showed that, so the impedance was at the maximum. Yes. So that's not resonance. This is like a Q for this is for uh, you know an inductor. Do you know why is happening? Why is that happening? Yes. 
I don't know for sure. Um, I think. And then it repeats itself. Of course, it's another one bigger than that one. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if it's just the geometry um, of the of the material because this is two mils, um, and this is much much thinner. So I think. It's very interesting. Yep. Okay. So this is an example of um, one of the one of the uh, simulations that uh, our, our colleague Yoshi Fukawa did um, using EMI stream, and this is he, what he did was take a normal core with, with 24 mils with 580 decap uh, decaps on it, on it, um, and then he measured kind of the noise on the on on this board. He simulated a board basically and measured the noise on it. He did another simulation um, by taking off the decaps, and as you can see, there's more noise on the board. And then finally, he put the Ferret Flux MC24M in uh, without decaps, and you can see there's less noise on the board. So this is the kind of, you know, it's very basic, but this is the kind of simulations that we can do with your board if you're interested in, um, in, in looking at whether this can help, can, can help you. And then this is transfer impedance, so uh, very similar, you know, one area of the PDN affecting another area of the PDN, and we can actually simulate this as well. Uh, so this just kind of shows transfer impedance with a FR4 core, and then transfer impedance with the MC24M, which is the one mil, uh, the one mil Ferroflux core. So, uh, these are a couple examples where we uh, we had a, a customer that uh, was able to remove decoupling capacitors from the board, and you can see on the left side this is uh, a board that has the decoupling capacitors, and then on the right this is uh, without the decoupling capacitors, so you can remove them. Um, they were actually able to put more uh, on this board as well, so I think there was a couple of elements here that they were able to actually add over to here because they just had more real estate. Um, as well as the decoupling capacitors, you also have to deal with all of the traces, all of the, the holes that you have to drill. So, I mean, it's, it, it is quite a bit more complicated when you have the decoupling capacitors in the mix. Um, here's the second one. This is just a 14 layer design that did the same thing. You can see it's much cleaner without the decoupling capacitors. Um, another thing to say is that you can actually uh, have two voltage levels or multiple voltage levels um, within. Um, you know each each plane, and so we do see some customers that have more than one. Uh, um, you know they kind of split the, the power plane into more than one area, so that's just kind of showing them doing that here. Um, or you can split it into more than one capacitor, um, so you have the same voltage but you have you know, different capacitors in a different area. Um, so this is an example of how you can take uh, the Ferroflex laminate and just insert it into a design. So this is a, a, a design that we worked on that is using FR4 laminate for the power and ground planes and then we just inserted the ferro flex laminate in. And by doing that you can actually reduce the thickness slightly. Um, in some designs that's, that's really important is to get it as thin as possible. But I think that the main key takeaway here is that you're really not adding anything uh, in terms of thickness. You're just replacing um, you're replacing the, your existing design with something that's a little bit thinner. Does it change the stress, the strength? Does it change the strength? The actual strength of the board? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Most of these designs are very high, uh, fairly high layer count anyway. Um, so I, mean, I would probably say no, but um, I don't have data to, to show you. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've seen up to people use like five or six layers of this material in, uh, you know, high layer count. I've not seen any appreciated amount of, of structural change in, in the board. Because most of it, there's still enough FR4, you know, enough reinforced material in there to give it structural integrity. But on a four layer board, it might. Well, well again, even if, even if four layer, depending on what pre you're using, yeah. right. you know, it still is going to be yeah. probably it's very strong. thin. You're not gonna, yeah. I, I think it is critical to have, you know, to be as symmetrical as possible, I think, right? I mean, especially yeah, if you like it to be symmetric. is always a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, was another. I was just questioning temperature. What in terms of the electrical that? performance or? TC, mm. temperature coefficient. I don't know if we've done electrical performance, have electrical, uh, temperature versus electrical performance.
performance. I have not seen any data on that yet, but that's something I can check on. I'll have to ask. It's 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 very stable though, as far as temperature yeah. goes. It's not gonna it's not gonna affect the material. Yeah. In fact, usually usually the, the these embedded capacitor materials are more stable than the material that's holding everything together. You know, the ceramic material because they're film based and they're very they're very strong, very good electrical strength, and, and uh, they get they're better at temperature performance. Yeah, so here's just a cross section uh, uh, of the embedded capacitance material in, in a board. You can see how thin it is compared to the other layers that are around here. So this is the MC12M, so it's a half mil, about a half mil thickness dielectric. MC12TM, excuse me. So that's the high, high dielectric constant version. Um, we had a customer that did a study on reliability and using discrete surface mount capacitors versus using the ferret flex and basically they put both in a, in a chamber um, at 150 degrees C um, under 600 volts, 650 volts and found that actually the discrete surface mount capacitors ended up failing um, faster than the ferret flex material, which is not too surprising. I mean, you have something on the surface versus having something embedded in the board um, of course, it's going to be affected by oxygen and other things that are happening on the surface. Okay, so some processing consider considerations. You know, um, there are many uh, board shops that are using these materials, um, both in the U.S. and in really high volume in Asia. Um, you know, the, there are a few process considerations that, that, uh, that to, to keep in mind. Um, the big one is, you know, it's a thin material, so anything that you would have to do to process a thin material, you need to do here. Um, so using lead, a leader uh, board or frames is typically recommended. Um, a lot of times we recommend that, that uh, customers offset the plane edges to avoid cutting into the dielectric, because what happens is if you have, uh, if you have a plane um, that are basically lining up together on either side of the board and then somebody picks it up, that can kind of flop over and cut the, the edge of the dielectric. Um, so that edge of, or the foot of the, um, of the trace is actually, can, can get kind of sharp and you're dealing with something that's pretty thin. So um, a lot of times, you know, people just offset those, uh, those planes. <clears throat> the other is um, retain as much copper as possible. You're dealing with something that's pretty, um, pretty thin. And so if you're processing that through a shop by itself as a double-sided board, you want to retain as much copper as possible to prevent movement. Um, and then on that layer only, we really suggest using solid uh, borders. You can use your regular border pattern on, um, on the other layers and it really doesn't affect anything, but on, on the Ferroflex layer, it makes sense to just use solid borders so that everything kind of holds together and doesn't move. Um, and then uh, it is compatible with plasma or chemical desmere. Um, sometimes if you're dealing with having more than one material in a, in a board, the desmere etch rate will be slightly different. And so you have to consider that. Um, and just make sure that you're not desmearing our material at a higher rate or lower than the, than the surrounding material. <clears throat> so conclusions, so um, you know, the embedded capacitance material is really used to improve performance of the, of the power distribution network. Um, it's used uh, to make thinner, smaller, lighter uh, circuit boards. And it's used for higher reliability. Um, and you know, a lot of times customers don't have one reason to use it. There's kind of like a, a package of reasons. It's like, okay, we want to use this because it works much better for our designs. We already know it works, and we have a, we have a set of reasons behind it. Um, but a lot of times, it's hard to nail down the one reason, and it's a, it's a combination of those three things. Um, they're compatible with PCB processing, so. Um, the, the, the vast majority of PCB uh, shops can process these materials. Uh, they're commercially available, like I said, in high volume out of Asia, or we have our quick turn uh, warehouse here in the US, and uh, they're agreed in lead free solution. So, this is our contact information if you have any questions. Yeah.